This podcast is brought to you by Aetna. Learn how Aetna is working to build a healthier world by visiting aetnastory.com. Hi, this is Trisha. Just a quick reminder before we get to our guest today that the Achieving Optimal Health Conference is on Saturday, October 26th at Georgetown University, and we really hope all of you plan to join us. You'll come and be inspired by luminaries in health and wellness and take home real strategies to improve your happiness and wellness. You can get all the information you need at AchievingOptimalHealthConference.com. And now for the show. People are yearning for information. Having the opportunity to encourage people and to educate people and inspire people. It's amazing to be able to say we'll carve out time to take care of ourselves. There's something for everyone. Our guest today on Health Gig is our great friend, Kristen Kirkpatrick. Kristen is the lead dietitian and manager of wellness nutrition services at the Cleveland Clinic Wellness Institute in Cleveland, Ohio. She is a best-selling author, an experienced presenter, and an award-winning dietitian. Kristen is asking the question, how are you fueling? Everywhere she goes, you've probably seen her on the Today Show or the Dr. Oz Show asking this very question. Today, Kristen joins us on Health Gig, and we ask her to ask you, how are you fueling? Kristen, welcome to Health Gig. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here with you today. Well, it's so much fun having you, and you're one of our favorite nutritionists. So we wanted to begin by asking you, what is the latest and greatest in nutrition science? The latest and greatest in nutrition science is further confusion. And I know that's a weird (laughs) answer to that, but when you really look at it, and when I definitely look at it, I mean, I see hundreds of patients a year. It used to be that people would come to me and say, well, can you help me manage a Mediterranean diet? Or can you help me with this diet? Or I really want to prevent heart disease. What's the best diet? Now, many of my patients come to me and they'll say, oh my gosh, I'm so confused. There's the ketogenic diet. There's this diet. There's that diet. First, I was told to eat low fat. Now I'm told to eat high fat. What's right? What I always look at in terms of the latest and greatest in diets is something that we have not looked at enough of in the past decade, and that is, what's the latest and greatest that works for you? Mm -hmm. Everybody is different. I think that when we ask those questions and we think about, okay, what's the latest and greatest? And if you had to say, what's the most popular, I would say ketogenic. If you look at what the U.S. News and World Report just rated in terms of diet, ketogenic comes in last. So that's why popular demand and popular opinion and what is scientifically supposed to be best are really at odds right now. So that's why I'm encouraging my patients, my friends to really look at, kind of look deeper at themselves. What does your environment say will be the best for you? If you want to become vegan and let's say your spouse is a huge meat eater, that might not happen. That might be too difficult to achieve. So I think we need to go a little bit more into personalized nutrition, even above and beyond genetics, and just kind of determine, hey, what's going to work for me? And stop comparing ourselves to our siblings, our neighbors, our friend who lost 20 pounds on a diet. You might not lose 20 pounds on that same diet. We have to really kind of take a step back and think about ourselves in terms of what's going to be the best. Just out of curiosity, what is scientifically best? Scientifically best, you know, this is year after year after year. The Mediterranean diet always comes forth as probably the best diet that people should follow. It is the most whole foods. It's not completely plant-based, as you know, but the red meat is very minimal and there's no processed red meat. It's closer, let's say, to a plant-based approach. High in whole grains, high in legumes, obviously high in fruits and vegetables. You know, that's, again, really at odds at what is popular, but from a scientific perspective, that seems to be best. Now, you know, because I've talked to you before, I've presented at your conference, we can look at science and do study after study and determine, okay, what is best? But one of the best examples that I always love to cite is looking at the dietary habits of people that live in blue zones. How do they eat? What are the components that they have that make them live so much longer than the rest of us and not just longer, but better? You know, in that case, there might be something to be said for having a completely plant-based approach and what that might do for longevity. I think that fasting needs to get more attention. It's definitely ramping up. There's definitely a lot more interest. But I think that we need to really take a hard look at how much around the clock are we eating? It's probably too much. To your point about what I say all the time, how are you fueling? Most people I know are over fueling. They're giving their bodies more than what they need. 
I would say that is the best thing to look at right now is Mediterranean diet, but it's not the most popular. You know, many of my postmenopausal women who see me, they do not want me to tell them to follow a Mediterranean approach because they'd rather be low carb. It's a tough question to answer, but from a scientific standpoint, if we simply look at the data, Mediterranean and DASH diet usually always went out. The thing that's coming to my mind, too, is what you're saying in what we call bioindividuality. Everybody's different, so therefore we need to find what supports us. But also, we change, right? So what might have worked for us in our 20s, 30s, 40s may not work for us in our 50s. And I think that that's something that should be part of that conversation. Do you agree? I always tell my patients that if you lived a certain way in your 20s and you change nothing, Mm -hmm. nothing, you're going to gain weight. It's just physiologically going to happen because of the loss of muscle that occurs at every decade, because of changing in hormones and things like that. But I think, Tricia, to your point, it's really also looking at being comfortable Mm -hmm. with that self. At my age, I'm 43 going on 44. I know I'm never going to have the body I had at 18. And quite frankly, I I don't know if I want that. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to be comfortable with where we are and what is realistic. So aspiring for our younger self is not always the healthy approach to take. What's the process in determining when someone comes to see you and they say, I need to be on a certain food plan? What's the process? One of the things I do do at Cleveland Clinic is nutrigenomics. So we could do a nutrigenomics test to get a little bit more into the genetics of what works and what won't work. It's one option. Some people don't want to do a genetic test. And so if we don't go that approach, I often will start with something non-food related, which is I'll ask them to tell me a little bit about their daily life. Who do they live with? Where do they live? Where do they grocery shop? So really getting that perspective first. There was a big study in the Journal of the American Medical Association a few years ago, and the big headline that came from that study was that obesity and thinness were both contagious. That was a correct statement based on the study and other studies that we have seen, that the company that we keep will oftentimes dictate our diet and even our weight. So Uh I often will start there to see what is actually realistic. A lot of times where I will go from that perspective is often asking, what do you like? And I think sometimes we neglect to say that. So a lot of times people will come to me and say, oh my gosh, do I have to eat kale? And my answer is usually, well, do you like kale? And if you don't, I can give you five other things that are just as good. Mm -hmm. Or what kind of exercise should I do? The answer is, what kind of exercise will you stick with? It's not what I think you should do. It's what Mm -hmm. you'll stick with because any movement is better than no movement at all. I think that we tend to go to the ideals of what we see as new and popular and trending in terms of the right food or the right exercise. But if it's not something that you're willing to do for longer than three weeks, it's not the right one for you. So I really do take a long look at the environmental surroundings that you have and the people that you are with to determine what is going to be most feasible. From that standpoint, of course, I'm going to look at age. Most women over the age of 40, I do put on a lower carbohydrate diet. doesn't mean that they're no carb, but I do have a very strong discussion on really focusing if we are going to have a carbohydrate, what are what I call the least offensive ones? What are the ones that are going to be best? From that perspective, also focusing on color. So, you know, color is a big thing for me because I'd rather you have a lot of different fruits and vegetables every day rather than just have tons of kale every day because you're getting the great nutrients from kale, but guess what? You're missing out on all the other nutrients that you get from other colors that are prevalent in produce. That's another place I'll look at. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we'll have a conversation about the timing of meals. Many of my patients come to me and within a few months, they could teach a class on nutrition. So it's not that they don't know what to eat or what's right or what's wrong. It's that they can't for whatever reason. It's that they'll binge if they have a stressful day at work or there's something they simply can't control. So a lot of times the other component that's really important to healthy eating is sometimes sitting down and talking with someone about why you got into the bad habits to begin with. Because that's not a dietary thing. That's a mental thing. And as you know, I could stop anyone on the street and say, what do you think is the biggest predictor from your childhood that you now carry in adulthood in terms of eating? We all have them. What worked or what didn't work when we were kids tends to stick with us. 
So really kind of battling against that can be another step and really trying to focus on those things that are most important in terms of getting back to yourself, not the comparison of things. And then lastly, the fasting component. I think that's a really big one. Most of my patients do very well with time-restricted eating which is limiting the hours in which you eat to either eight hours a day or 10 hours a day. That fits out great for my patients. A lot of my patients struggle with late night eating. If you struggle with late night eating and your range is 11 to 7 every day, you just don't have a choice. You're not going to eat something after 7. So I think that's another way to really kind of control your food intake, control a lot of things, cravings, hunger, a lot of things like that. When you were talking about trends and being aware of trends, you can't not think about the evolution of understanding fat in our diet. Back in the 80s, we were, you know, eating fat-free Entenmann cookies, right? Right. Fat-free bread. (laughs) And we were substituting the fat with sugar, right, and carbs. Can you talk a little bit about what happened there? And now fast forward to where we are today, where I think everybody is beginning to understand how important fat is in their diet, but you still talk to people that will not add fat to their diet because right. we really believe that eating fat makes me fat and it's just brainwashed. Right. And the role of fat, right, in the Mediterranean diet is important in any healthy diet. So if you can talk about that, and then can we talk about the fat in the waist? Okay. Go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. So let's start with the Mediterranean diet yeah. and fat. So obviously olive oil is a huge component of the Mediterranean diet. Olive oil, olives, nuts, avocado. Um, especially things like peanuts, avocado. Um, so we're really looking at a huge focus on the monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats polyunsaturated fats coming from the seeds and fatty fish like wild salmon, and then monounsaturated coming from peanuts, olive oil, etc. It's funny, you know, there was a chuckle when we talked about eating the snack wells and eating fat free. It's like, oh my gosh, how ridiculous that we thought that. And I often wonder 20 years from now, if we have a conversation on food, what will we be laughing about today? That's exactly like, what are we doing that's not right? (laughs) (laughs) I think there are plenty of studies now to prove that fat does not make you fat. I am a huge proponent of a higher fat diet. Number one, fat makes you full. You know, I always tell my patients, you want to eat in a way that your body is constantly struggling to metabolize something. The harder something is to metabolize and break down, the more full you're going to be, the more satisfied you're going to be. Carbohydrates are relatively easy to break down, whereas fats and proteins are not. It's the main reason why people on a ketogenic diet are like, I never have hunger. I mean, never during my day am I hungry. And that's because fat makes you incredibly full. The other benefit of more fat in the diet is that you don't have increases in insulin or blood sugar. When we see a roller coaster of insulin up and down and up and down from a higher carbohydrate pattern, that then leads more to inflammation, more chronic disease. And I know you mentioned belly fat. That's another big Mm, one. That's huge. So I think that's why for many of my female patients, especially that are perimenopausal, postmenopausal, a lot of them, their main complaint is that belly fat. Like, oh, I woke up one morning and all of a sudden I have a belly. Like this never happened. Some of that is hormonal, but can be definitely assisted with a higher fat approach because you're taking away that need to secrete insulin. And insulin does promote belly fat. So Mm. not to say we should never have a carbohydrate because I don't really believe in extremes of any kind. I think there's plenty of very good carbohydrates, lentils, for example, very healthy carbohydrate. But we have to be choosy about the ones we have. And when I was saying earlier about really kind of looking at high quality carbohydrates or what I call upgraded carbohydrates, those are actually carbohydrates that have some sort of mix of, let's say, fat or protein added into them. So again, trying to achieve that very hard to digest component and taking away foods that are easy to digest. Fat keeps you full. And we all know, everyone listening and everyone talking today knows what happens when you get too hungry. Right. Rationality goes out the window. That whole advice of never go to the grocery store when you're hungry (laughs) has always been an accurate piece of advice (laughs) because I've done it and it's not pretty what happens in my cart. If you go when you're not hungry, you make better decisions. So in general, I think the most important thing with fat, in addition to everything else, is that it keeps you from feeling that hunger where you're going to go binge. Mm -hmm. While we're talking about fats, what are the good fats and what are the devil of fats? If we were going to talk about the devil of fats, that would definitely be trans fats. 
when we have had them added to products, and that comes in the form of partially hydrogenated oils, that has been shown to lead to early death, heart disease, really bad stuff. In fact, it's been so bad that they've now been banned in the food industry. So we're not going to see them anymore in food products. You know, when the government takes that step, it means there's just overwhelming evidence that it's just so bad for us. Trans fat is still found naturally, though, in full fat dairy and in meat. I don't tell my patients, oh, gosh, don't have full fat dairy and meat because there's trans fat, because the adverse effects that we've seen have come mainly from when it was added as partially hydrogenated oil. Mm -hmm. That's the devil. What I would say the more neutral one is that I think the jury is still out on would be saturated fat coming in the form of coconut oil, red meat, red processed meat, et cetera. We're not quite sure. I think we need a little bit more long-term data. When we look at studies looking at a higher saturated fat pattern and things such as an increased risk of certain cancers and heart disease and early death, there could be other components that are outlined there, such as the iron that's contained in some of those foods. Other things that we see that occur as a byproduct of meat consumption. It's probably maybe not the fat that's causing all the bad stuff, but it's still included in some of these studies. So I'd say that one, I would still tell my patients, don't go crazy. And then monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats are still the healthiest. Monounsaturated fats, obviously, coming from olive oil, peanuts, things like that, avocado, and then the poly coming from seeds, flaxseed, chia seed, and then fatty fish. Even when we talk about studies, we always have to take them with a grain of salt. There was a study that came out just last week, and it showed that vegans were more likely to have a stroke than meat eaters. And it was just kind of like, oh gosh, right? So if you really look at the studies, it was a really, really small association, and there were other things, and it was an observational study. There was self-reporting, but people take that and run. People take that and say, okay, well, steaks and cheeseburgers are back on the plate for me. Look at this. But we always have to be careful in how we interpret the headlines that are coming from studies as well. Can you tell us what the difference is between carbs and net carbs and the importance of understanding that? There's a huge difference there. So when you think about components to carbohydrates, the healthiest carbohydrates will also be higher in fiber. And many people don't recognize that the body cannot digest fiber in any way, has no clue how to do it. So fiber, for the most part, goes through the body undetected and then will go through, go through the colon. That's why we can have two different types of fibers that can help with lowering of cholesterol or helping with constipation issues, soluble versus insoluble. But the fact of the matter is you don't process it. So a net carb is essentially taking the total carbohydrate in a product or a food and subtracting out that fiber because mm -hmm. you're not digesting it anyway. The other thing that is often subtracted in a net carb calculation is sugar alcohol. Now, obviously, you're not going to find that in fresh fruit or a bean-based pasta, but you will find it in energy bars or maybe crackers or things that have a requirement of a little bit of sweetness. Sugar alcohol is also not digested by the body. I'm glad you brought that up because when I think of that age range, that gender, right. I'm typically not giving them a carb restriction. I'm giving them a net carb restriction. So I'll say, okay, your net carbs for the day have got to be 55, okay? And so when you focus on net versus whole, it forces you to be completely nitpicky about the type of carbohydrate you're choosing. So I'm not going to even dream about having white pasta because I'm going to blow it all in one meal. But if I do a bean-based pasta, I have a lot of carbohydrate left over because there's so much fiber in a bean-based pasta. It forces you to read labels mm -hmm. and it forces you to really kind of stop and say, okay, I have so much in my bank. Mm -hmm. Am I really going to use this for my bank? And if it doesn't have a lot of fiber, you're probably not. So here's a crazy question. Maybe you've gotten this before, I'm not sure. But if you were a food, what would you choose to be? And while you're thinking about it, I'm prepared so I can go. No, no, you go. Now I want to hear yours. Well, I think I'd be an avocado. <laughs> okay, why? Well, why? the reason mm -hmm. I think I'd like, I would be an avocado is I like the versatility it offers. I like that it can be a standalone meal, you know, and it fills you up. It has a lot of fat, a lot of fiber in it, right? It's got lots of good stuff in it, but then it can actually be added to other items to add the creaminess. So if I'm going to do my smoothie, I can do my avocado and build the nutrition in it. So I like the idea that I could stand alone or that I could be part of a community. I love it. Thank you.
what would you be? I think, and this is going to be, we're taping here and we're almost in October, so maybe a little cliche with the holidays, but I think I'd be a pumpkin for almost the same reason. Yeah. That's because cool. it is celebrated, obviously during Halloween and Thanksgiving and things like that, but yet there's so much use to it. And there's so many different components of a pumpkin you can use. So mm-hmm. you can use the seeds, the flesh. There was just a mouse study just came out showing that mice whose diet was 4% pumpkin flesh had a 20% reduction in blood pressure. Wow. And the mice that didn't have that. So there's just so much benefit, but yet I'm trying to think if there's any other, and I think it's a fruit, a pumpkin, that celebrated so much during a holiday. I mean, right. that is the symbol That's of the number Thanksgiving. One. Right? Yeah, yeah, so. that is. That is. You're right. Doro, how about you? I would be a carrot. <laughs> I like carrots a lot. I like to roast Rob, them. our producer, is on the floor. He wants to be a carrot, too, probably. Yeah. I've done a little research here. It's because it's antioxidant rich. It reduces the risk of cancer. Nobody like wants it. to get cancer. It grows in the ground. You know, it helps me be grounded. Oh, I like it. And also because I have bad eyesight. But, of course, that could be a myth. Kristen, what excites you most about the work that you do? What excites me, I think, is when I witness transformation. Mm. So when I see someone who perhaps has eaten in some manner their entire life and just hasn't been able to turn it around for whatever reason, and then somehow a light bulb goes off and they're able to. And I often tell people, sometimes you don't realize how bad you feel until you feel good. Mm -hmm. That bad becomes the norm. So when I see people say to me, gosh, for the first time in my life, I feel good. I feel like I have energy. I'm happier. That's the best component. And it takes hard work to get there. That Mm -hmm. doesn't happen on day 30. And sometimes it doesn't happen on day 365 either. I think that in my profession, you have to look for the fact that your relationships will be long term because food is difficult and it's something that we can't ignore. We have to eat every single day. Mm -hmm. Every single day we have to eat. And so it consistently follows us three meals a day and sometimes snacks. So transformation is so powerful to see because it's not just that someone feels better, but hopefully it's that they live longer. And then Mm -hmm. they pass those habits down to other people that surround them. Kristen, the index to measure obesity is the BMI. How accurate is that? I'm not a huge BMI fan. I don't like it because BMI tells you all the stuff that you have. It's simply looking at weights in kilograms to height in meters squared. Weights carries a lot of things and it doesn't tell you the muscle. It doesn't tell you how much water, things like that. For my patients, I'm often suggesting two things, either that they just do a waist measurement. And so for women, I want them to be 40 inches or less and 35 is the ideal or less. Many of the patients I work with are much higher than 40. And so 40 is more attainable in the beginning, and then we'll go to 35. So that's the first thing. And then the second is sometimes just figuring out how your pants feel. I think that the studies are mixed, whether or not it's a good idea to step on the scale every day or not. But I think that when we put on a pair of pants and it doesn't fit anymore, pretty good indicator that we've gained weight without having to step on the scale. So I don't like BMI because of the fact that it's not accounting for muscle. And the more muscle we have, as you know, the more lean you are. Grab a pair of pants that you want to get into, whatever diet plan you're on, and once a week, naked, no food in your stomach, whatever the case may be, maybe right when you wake up, you put those pair of pants on, and every week you assess what do they look like. And then one day, if you do things correctly and everything works in your manner, then those pants will fit better than the scale. Yeah, Unless you have pants in every size, which... You got to use the same pants, the same pants. Right. Okay, I'm not saying Sorry. it's me. I'm saying in case you do. No, That's a really no. good point. You know, I think BMI should go the way of the fat-free diet. Yes. I just think it's one yes. of those that just doesn't really matter. But it's used everywhere. I know. It's used everywhere and that's to the assess thing. health, even with, with life insurance. Kristen, what are your favorite foods? This is like probably like what we would call sharing too much, but my husband told me the other day, that I'm making too many Brussels sprouts. (laughs) And it's because of the gas, right? So he is constantly telling me, my gosh, stop with, can you give me one night without Brussels sprouts? So I would say Brussels sprouts year round, not just in the fall. (laughs) I just love them because I love to roast them. So I will take like a ridiculous amount of garlic 
and I'll just use a chopper and chop off the garlic. And then I will shave the Brussels sprouts and then mix the Brussels sprouts with my excess amount of garlic, some salt and pepper and olive oil. I don't think there's anything better tasting than that. I mean, I could have a bowl of that. Mm -hmm. It's so good. So I do like that. I love eggs. To your point about kind of how we vilified fat, we vilified eggs Egg yolks. for a very long yeah, time. Yeah, we'll see yolks, right? yeah. I think it's a great source of protein in the morning. It's easy to feed an egg to a child, right? Mm-hmm. Most kids like eggs, and so it's a great source of protein for them, especially because the protein in egg is what we call very highly bioavailable, very easy to absorb. I do like kale. I love apples. I love apples and peanut butter. That's mm-hmm. just such a satisfying snack. And I probably eat way too many mixed nuts. I'm human just like anyone is human. And so as much as I tell people to have color, sometimes I struggle with getting purple into my diet. So I'm always trying to strive to have a little bit more eggplant, cabbage. Cabbage, yeah. Uh, Doro, I will tell you that the purple carrots are fabulous. So uh-huh. that, that is a good, okay. Rob, that's a good one. Okay, Rob, no laughing. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but yeah, that, those would be like probably my, my top picks. If you could recommend one book that everyone should read, what would that be? When I was getting out of college years ago, my mother sent me a book called The Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker. I made fun of her because it's all about, as a woman, how we don't tap into our instincts and our gut feelings about when we're in a bad situation or when we're with a bad person. And we continue on with that because we don't want to be seen as difficult. My mother is all about, like, you have to watch for everything in life. So that's why I made fun of her. But then, you know, we truly do turn into our mothers because (laughs) I found that I gave that book in the past five to six years to every girlfriend that I have. So I have probably bought 50 copies of that book to give as gifts. I still think it's the best book I've ever read as a woman because it has taught me when I need to tap into my gut feelings. Even at the grocery store, someone has a conversation with me. If I have a bad gut feeling, I'm going to get out of that conversation. And I never used to do that for the reasons that I had mentioned, which is I didn't want to seem like I wasn't a nice person. It's not a health book, but it is the book that has impacted me the most in terms of trying to navigate through the world that we now live in and not being overly cautious, but tapping into when you feel something's not right. And then do you have a favorite quote you can share with everyone? Yes. I have this little frame next to the sink in my kitchen and every month I switch the quote around and I always try and incorporate the quotes with my kids. So the other day Jake comes home And he was very upset about something that he didn't get in school. And he was upset because he always got it in school and this time he didn't. And so the quote was perfect. And the quote is, never let your failures go to your heart or your successes go to your head. Mm -hmm. And it's true, I think, for everyone. But it was a great teaching moment for me because he was successful with this component with reading. It was in class every single time. And at this one time, he wasn't. I just said, hey, everybody makes mistakes. Everybody falls down. Mm -hmm. So we have to be humble about the things we're great at and the things that we know we excel at. And then when we fall, we just can't have that fill our hearts. We move on and we keep trying. So I think that's the quote that I most wanted to share today. That's a great one. Kristen, as always, spending time with you, it's just been incredible. Thank you for all your information and thank you for sharing all this knowledge with our listeners. Thank you so much, Kristen. We look forward to seeing you very soon. Well, thank you. It was so great to be here. Thank you for joining us on Health Gig. We loved having you with us. We hope you'll tune in again next week. In the meantime, be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast and follow us on healthgigpod.com. I'm Trisha. And I'm Doro. Be well.